On returning to the river, he found his carefully hidden equipment had been stolen. He followed the trail to a small village deep in the mountains. There was a confrontation, and after some force, he doesn't elaborate, he got most of it back. This was just one of many bad encounters with people along the river. After doing, doing 600 kilometers, when your idle speed being stalled, it's the best, it's the best one we've done expedition so far. He prepares for another day of many days on the river. Two months after beginning his journey, Mike was still in the canyon shooting Force 5 rapids in waterfalls blind every day. His knee was getting worse and after a particularly hard bang against a rock, he had to lie for days on a beach, waiting for the pain to pass. A couple of days later, he lost another flipper, and after carefully hiding his equipment, he started the long hike over the mountains back to Cusco. Returning to the river a week later, he was forced to hire guides to find his equipment, explaining landmarks he had memorized on the way out. It's 4.30 in the morning. Um, I'm still looking for my hydro speed. The way they explained to me I've got to go up uh, two, uh, two vertical kilometers. That's more or less in distance. I have to do eight kilometers today. But uh, it's not the distance that's important. It's really going up and going down. Uh, hopefully by 12 o'clock, between 12 and 2, I'll be reaching the river where, um, where I hit my hydro speed. And I hope it's there. I did a four-day beat tour, uh, just listening to one guy that said, no, it's a quicker way, and it's not really a quicker way. You can't really trust the people, and you have to do it, uh, do, it with, do it your way. After days of trekking across mountains and false trails, he descended once more to the river, to landmarks he hoped he recognized. Yes, baby! After another month in the canyons, he finally began to reach the flat water and the Amazon forests, the second major goal of the expedition. As he approached the forest, he began to encounter headwinds of over 100 kilometers an hour and waves coming up the river at him of three meters or more, pushing him backwards at times. Now he could find wood on the beaches to make fires at night and he could reorganize and assess damage to his equipment especially his argon radio beacon, which was activated by punching in a code which sent various messages in his global position by satellite to his base camp in Switzerland. Messages like an SOS to come and get him. There is very little clean water to be had on the Amazon, and one of Mike's other essential pieces of equipment was his water purifier, which removes the river sediment and produces good clean water. You have, to, you have to know certain things, where to find food, how to look for water, how to fish. If you don't, um, if you don't know it, it doesn't come naturally. It's really, you have to know what you can eat, uh, how to walk, where to sleep. You have to know a lot of things that, uh, that the people of the Amazon actually taught me. 
and without them teaching me teaching me these things I, I don't think this expedition would would have uh, would have been possible The immense network of streams, rivers, swamps, flooded rainforest and lakes gather water from a basin which would cover the entire United States of America in forest. The Amazon River is 300 kilometers wide at its mouth and even 1500 kilometers upriver it is only narrow to some 10 kilometers. The discharge of water into the sea is 16 times that of the Nile and would fill Lake Ontario in three hours. The river contains more types of fish than the Atlantic Ocean and in the forest itself live the most exotic variety of animals on earth and half the world's bird species in an environment that will change since the time of the dinosaurs. It has been estimated that 35% of the total number of species in the forest still have to be identified. All this Mike was to encounter but surviving the wild was far easier than surviving the people. Pages from his diary reveal that his equipment was stolen again this time by the Peruvian military. Relenting after a mixture of threats and bribes, they gave most of it back. He was entering the red zone in Peru, a part of the river controlled by the military, trying to counter river pirates and drug dealers. He was often shot at by people from the side of the river, and once had to swim towards two madmen who were hunting him with a shotgun from a dugout canoe and confront them. The river splits into many channels here, and it took careful navigation with compass and map to plot a course. The Yashaninka Indians who live along the river were unpredictable. Sometimes they were friendly, and he was able to talk to them and buy food. Mike tells the story of the night he was invited to sleep with a family, but was woken by eight men with guns. He managed to escape, but Downriver was caught again and surrounded. The superstitious Indians thought he was a devil, swimming under the water and coming up to kill people with the pills in his first aid kit. They started playing with his argon radio and inadvertently put on the automatic SOS signal which saved his life alerting Peruvian marines who began to search for him in helicopters, the sound of which frightened his captors, and they let him go. Unlike these Ashenenkas, there are tribes along some of the tributaries who have never encountered strangers. To them, the river is an evil spirit, and anyone emerging from them must be the devil himself. After that, he stayed in the river, sometimes for a week or more, without putting a foot on land, sleeping on his hydro board. He avoided all contact with human beings, not trusting anyone, and fishing for his food and foraging on deserted banks. Day and night he dodged huge ships which, with a river an average 30 meters deep, can sail to cities thousands of kilometers upstream. The river became so wide, up to 100 kilometers of places, that it would take Mike two days just to swim to the banks. Some thousand kilometers from the mouth, Mike began to feel the effects of the tide pushing upstream and he began to alternate between hydro speed and canoe because swimming continually against such a tide was impossible. As Mike approached the sea, his mind began to rebel against the ending of his epic journey. Just how would he handle normal life again? Would his wife and small children accept him once more? For six months, the river had been his master. Now he must adapt to life again. In 171 days, 7 hours and 45 minutes, Mike Horn finally tasted salt water. He had reached the Atlantic Ocean and accomplished what no man had done before. The complete solo navigation of the continent of South America from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic, swimming the full length of the Amazon River from source to sea.